My name is Ed Bilski. I'm the Vice President for Research and Scholarship. I had the fortune to meet some of the first years yesterday, and for those who have not yet met, uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to kick this off with a welcoming message from Senator Ayotte in New Hampshire. Uh, I like to you know, say that we are the University of New England, and we draw heavily from uh, the New England states for our medical and other health professional uh, programs. And we also place students in training sites all over uh, the New England region, including New Hampshire. And I've had the fortune of really working with a lot of great uh, senators and congressmen and women around some of the issues that we're going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. And the staff are just fantastic to work with, too. So Senator Ayotte really has taken up an interest in both uh, the addiction side of substance abuse, misuse, and she's also very interested in chronic pain and the balance that needs to be achieved. And she wanted to send her uh, welcoming remarks. She couldn't be here today personally. Uh, so with that, Carl's going to start the video. Thank you for allowing me to share a few words with you at today's discussion. I would especially like to thank Dr. Ed Bilski for his work to organize this important summit. I also want to welcome the University of New England's first year medical students who are here today. Happy first day of classes. Today you will hear from a number of qualified speakers on the often complex world of pain management. You'll also hear about how we can work together to make sure that those in need receive quality care and support, while also reducing overprescribing and misuse of drugs that have addictive properties, like opioids. As you know, New England is in the midst of an opioid abuse epidemic, which is a very serious public health crisis. And sadly, According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, four out of five new heroin users reported misusing prescription opioids first. By incorporating science and public health knowledge with advocacy and policy, we can work toward developing and integrating a comprehensive approach to this crisis. A key piece of that approach includes continuing the dialogue around responsible pain management, prescribing practices, and that's why I'm so grateful that you're hosting this important discussion today. Another critical piece <coughs> of legislation, and I'm pleased to share that an important legislative effort to address the opioid abuse crisis from all angles, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, also known as CARA, was signed into law just a few weeks ago. In the Senate, I was proud to work for nearly three years with colleagues across the aisle to draft and introduce this legislation. And CARA becoming law is a turning point in this fight. CARA established a policy framework to respond to the heroin and prescription opioid crisis focused on several major areas, prevention, treatment, recovery, and support for our first responders. CARA was successful because it included input from stakeholders with many different backgrounds, including prescribers, pain management specialists, and public health officials. In helping develop this legislation, I sat down with families and heard heartbreaking stories of loss. I went on ride-alongs with local police departments and saw first responders administer, administer Narcan to save someone's life. I've also had meetings with members of the medical community to discuss the need to balance pain management and treating legitimate pain needs with responsible prescribing practices and preventing the misuse and abuse of opioids. That's a fundamental part of fighting this epidemic, and I'm glad you're here to discuss it today. We know that this crisis is taking far too many lives from us, but the conversation around addiction is changing, and we are starting to recognize that addiction, for what it is, it's a disease. Because of your dedication to delivering the highest quality of care and willingness to provide input from your work on the front lines, we can begin to turn around the tide of addiction. Thank you again for allowing me to share a few words today. I'm grateful for your commitment to serving the community and saving lives, and I wish you all the best as you continue this summit. So again, thank you to uh, Senator Ayotte and her staff for making that possible. We also have representatives from the Maine delegation, both on the Senate and the House of Representatives side, and a panel with uh, Congresswoman Shelley Pingree later today. Uh, that's going to be quite exciting. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce Sean Mackey. Sean, I've known for many years. He's a luminary in the field of, of pain medicine. He's at Stanford University and runs a pain clinic and uh, one of the preeminent uh, research uh, groups in the country, in the nation. And uh, he's also got something that he's going to talk about that he's very passionate about, and he'll, he'll I think, bring in some personal aspects of that story. So without further ado, Sean Mackey.
Wow, what a turnout. Very excited to be here. I want to thank Ed, not only for the invitation to come to your beautiful state and this uh, fabulous facility, but probably more importantly for his leadership in this space. What I've, uh, I've seen here is truly a, a great leader and a visionary who has seen what it takes to bring people together from not only all walks of life, but also recognizing the importance of bringing together trainees. When I look upon the University of New England and I see the research being done here, it's clear that uh, pain research and research in general and clinical care is alive, it's thriving, and it's clearly making an impact not on your local community but also at a national level. So it's with that I'm really honored and uh, pleased to be here with you to talk about one of my passions, which is uh, choir and learning health systems. So by way of introduction and background, I I uh, am a faculty member at Stanford University. I've been there now for about 15 years. And what I'm probably most known for, what we've most published on, is in the area of cognitive neurosciences. So I do a lot of brain imaging. Uh, I spend a lot of time using MR-based technologies to open up windows into your brain to see where pain is processed and perceived, to understand the mechanisms of pain and what happens when it goes bad, and then to ideally translate that into novel, safe, and effective treatments. Why? Because at my heart, I'm a physician. I uh, trained, a, I'm a recovering anesthesiologist. I, I haven't done anesthesiology for about uh, over 10 years now. I take care of patients with chronic pain. I see patients a day a week in the clinic, and the other six I'm typically in the lab. And I see patients with chronic pain because, one, I have a passion for that as well. I want to help relieve the pain and suffering of people. And two, because that's where the best ideas come from, from a research standpoint. And it gives us an opportunity to see how our discoveries are impacting directly those who are suffering from pain. But this isn't about brain imaging. This is fundamentally about the question, and this is a question to all the medical students out there, is you're taking care of people with chronic diseases in particular, not just pain, but this will apply to diabetes, heart disease, asthma, you name it. How do we really know if we're getting a patient better? And so let me start off with the disclosures. You always want to know whose pocket uh, your speaker's got their hand in, and I'll share with you that all of my conflicts are with the National Institutes of Health. I have uh, no uh, industry conflicts. I'm working really hard to get more conflicted by the NIH, but it's, it's a tough time, as everyone uh, out there knows, and I want to give my thanks. The NIH Pain Consortium provided some early funding for uh, this effort that I'm going to now lead into. So it helps if we all start with a patient, because really at the end of all of this, it's about the people with pain. It's about our people who suffer that are uh, why we're here and what the focus is. So this is Sandra. Sandra was uh, 10 years ago a 21-year-old young woman in upstate Pennsylvania who was driving to college and listening to Britney Spears on the radio when out of the blue she was T-boned by uh, another motor vehicle and she injured her ankle and she was taken to the emergency department and she was treated there and then released. Her ankle healed up but her pain never went away. Pain never went away. She ended up getting diagnosed with this terrible condition called complex regional pain syndrome. It is this 24 hour a day hot burning poker in your arm or your extremity that's with you all the time and it just takes over people's lives. She moved to Florida where she works for Walt Disney World, the Magic Kingdom, and had 10 years of treatment all without getting any significant improvement and she flies out to see me at Stanford on an intermittent basis. She obviously gave me permission to use her story and she's been written up on this as well. This pain that she has sometimes has a tendency to spread to other extremities and in her case it spread to her shoulder, her hand, and it's had a huge impact on her quality of life as well as her family's quality of life. And so I'll tell you, with that as the case example, let me now go back in time similarly to around the same time. In this case, this is my personal story starting in 1999, and I came on as a brand new assistant professor at Stanford joining the pain division. There was probably eight or ten people in the whole division, and I was met by Ron Pearl, who was just coming in as my chair. And Ron said to me, by the way, Sean, he says, welcome to the faculty. I just want you to know, I have uh, only four problems with your division that you're joining. I said, four problems? That's easy. That's great. I can take on those four problems, Ron. And I'm an, ex I'm an engineer by training. We love to solve problems. And he, I said, what are those four problems, Ron? He said, your finances, your research, your education, and your clinical care. <laughs> I said, oh. I said, OK. Where to start? And he was right. Our finances were terrible back then. We were losing half a million dollars. Our 
research, we had none, and we never had any real substantive research in the division, uh, no NIH funding, uh, and it was a difficult time for anesthesia trainees back then. Everybody's going into primary care. I said, but our clinical care, Ron, I said, our clinical care is great, and he said, how do you know? And he's an intensive care doc who's used to looking at biomarkers and blood pressure and whether somebody's alive or dead. And I said, well, I'm getting these beautiful bottles of wine as thank yous. I get these nice crates of fruit from the farmers out in Central California to thank me, these wonderful fruitcakes over the holidays. So how do you really know they're getting better? And I said, I really don't know. And so at that time, my son, who was born at Stanford and has been part of the family, you know, looked at me and he said, that's unacceptable. He just said, that's absolutely unacceptable. And so that set me on this journey to answer this basic question. How do we know if we're making somebody like Sandra better? And more importantly, how do we know what is the right treatment, the right treatment for the right person for a specific condition? The challenge in answering that is when you're looking at a condition like pain, it gets really complicated. It gets complicated because if you've been at the talks today, you've learned that there's a lot of factors that play a role in pain. We have over 1,700 proteins and 1,200 genes that are involved. As many of you in medical school, you're going to learn in anatomy, we have over 108 muscles, 70 nerves, 47 nerve entrapments that have been diagnosed and associated with pain, 26 psychosocial determinants or diagnoses. We have over 400 different physical exam approaches. And now in the area of treating pain, we have over 200 interventions. These are procedural interventions, now over 200 different medications, of which the vast majority, by the way, are not opioids. And then let's go ahead and connect all of this together into a network diagram. And so for the students, there'll be a quiz on this at the end of the hour. Uh, this is what we ask our pain fellows to try to keep in their head. And it's absolutely impossible to track all of these determinants. And by the way, this just includes some of the biomechanical and social determinants. It leaves out a number of the genetic and the other molecular ones. It is incredibly complicated. Adding on to that is the issue with treatments. One of the dirty little secrets that maybe the medical students you guys haven't learned yet is the following. That for randomized controlled trials, which are the gold standard of how we assess the efficacy of a treatment, the way we run them, and I run huge numbers of them at our center, is the following. We screen tremendous numbers of people. And for every 100 people that we bring into a randomized control trial, I'm sorry, for every 100 people we screen, for a randomized controlled trial, we'll only bring 10 in. Because those are the only 10 that are very homogeneous, that meet the criteria for entering into our trial. But the problem is, those 10, those 10 up here, they don't look anything like Sandra. They don't look anything like the people you're going to take care of in your clinic. These are incredibly filtered, homogeneous people. For instance, OK, I do have one brain imaging slide. I had to pull out one. This was the first uh, study on using brain-based biomarkers to detect the presence or absence of chronic low back pain that we published a few years ago. And I took 47 people with chronic low back pain and matched them to 47 healthy controls. And using some advanced machine learning techniques, we can identify with about 76% accuracy whether somebody has chronic low back pain. Now, the problem is those 47 people that we took in, they are on no medications. They have no emotional distress. They have no ridiculous symptoms. They don't look like a single person I've ever seen in my clinic. And yet, we take this kind of information and we draw inferences from it. We take these randomized control trials, they go through the FDA trials of phase two, phase three, they get accepted, they put out into the wild now, and they're used on that 90% of the people that are those that were cared for, and that was never generalized. It was actually never tested in the wild in that environment. So these are some of the problems we have with RCTs. Now, the Institute of Medicine, or the Nas what is now the National Academy of Medicine, has recognized this for some time. I was honored to be on the original IOM report that put out the pain, uh, relieving pain in America study. And one of the major findings that we put forward is that we need better data on our patients with pain, the prevalence of it to determine what works, what doesn't work. I was honored to follow up and co-lead the oversight committee with Dr. Linda Porter, who you're going to hear from later today. And she's going to give you a really beautiful overview of the national pain strategy, which puts forward a strategic plan for the entire nation and how we should move forward. We called for the need for more data on the prevalence onset course, the impact, 
the outcomes for chronic pain conditions. And then, for those of you who are interested in this space, there's a 12-part series from the IOM called the Learning Healthcare System, which called for the development of learning healthcare systems in which we bring together. We bring together science, informatics, we do financial incentives, and we align our culture to enhance continuous quality improvement. So what is the component of these learning healthcare systems, a term that may be quite new to you, but I promise you is going to be in your future and is going to be part of uh, advancing healthcare. And it's where we are bringing together large amounts of data in real time, where we're using science and informatics to analyze that data and present that information back to you in a digestible manner so that you can help better assess and care for your patients, where we use this information as a teaching tool for our patients to better engage them, to do motivational interviewing, to change behaviors, where we align our incentives so that we start paying people for good quality care and quality outcomes, and ultimately it leads to a cultural change and to more of an outcomes-based medical approach. The NIH has recognized this for several years, and they've been calling for improvements in high-throughput technologies in taking this type of data, being able to rapidly translate it from our laboratory environments, even from our clinical environments, into clinical care. But the problem is that the platforms that we've been all handed provide incredible subject burden to our patients and our subjects. The physicians also can't, can't digest all this information. It's just too much data. We need better ways of packaging it. We haven't been able to find ways of generalizing the data. And so we've got this challenge, and I was faced with this challenge several years ago, and I thought, well, what we really need to do is develop a whole new platform as a way to address this call from the NIH and also from the National Academy of Medicine. And that's what set, set me on this path back in 2010 to start the development of this package called CHOIR, the Collaborative Health Outcomes Information Registry, which is meant as an open source, open standard, highly flexible and free, my favorite four-letter F word, free, health and treatment registry and a platform for a learning health system. And I present this as a use case for you because there are companies out there that are building these type of platforms and we're starting to see them more and more. But I wanna, I'm clearly gonna focus on this. And again, no financial commitment to this because we're just giving it all away. And the purpose of this is an informatics platform that's meant to give you information at point of care to assess your patients and help you make the treatment decisions, to be able to do in-clinic integrated comparative effectiveness research, longitudinal outcomes research to track people over time, to do what's called pragmatic trials. These pragmatic trials are trials in which you're actually studying patients in a clinic setting. You're taking the other 90%, the people that you're actually caring for, and you're treating them in a real world, a real world RCT. And in this, we wanna be able to also give you information to help make intelligent decisions about how to care for patients and to get a comprehensive phenotype across all dimensions of physical, psychological, and social domains. So we slowly and quietly built this platform using a number of uh, collaborators and uh, partners. And we realized that early on, if you're gonna build these types of platforms, you have to get everybody engaged. Everybody who's involved in the care of a patient has to be a key stakeholder and get their input. We also needed to make it um, web-based so it wasn't dependent on particular platforms and to be able to give added value back by giving reports and other information to the clinician. I'll talk about that. Before getting there, let me just give you a couple words about our center because this is the initial use case for this. So at the Stanford Pain Management Center, we're the largest academic pain center, I think west of Pittsburgh. I think Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh's got a really big center. We see about 20,000 patient visits across all types of chronic pain conditions. And we have uh, approximately 25 boarded clinicians in pain medicine. Now I've got to update the slide. A number of pain psychologists and an interdisciplinary platform upon which we provide um, physician support, psychology support, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, nutrition biofeedback, acupuncture, and we've built a number of these subspecialty programs in collaborations with other departments. In fact, it's not unlike what Ed has been working to build here through this interdisciplinary collaborative effort. So with that, the stage and the use case, we saw early on that there was value in leveraging this huge investment that the NIH has made in recasting patient reported outcomes. And so if you're gonna measure your patient's fatigue, anxiety, depression, sleep, physical function, there's been this recognition that many of the survey instruments that we've been using for decades have got significant limitations. 
The NIH recognized this and has put in what I think is about $120 million or so to developing what's called PROMISE, the Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System. And if you're interested in characterizing your patients, you might want to go onto the PROMISE website. What it is, in essence, is a series of questions and answers. But it's a unique set of questions and answers that leverages something called item response theory and computer adaptive testing. And so it allows you to very rapidly characterize these different domains. And I'll show you what I mean by rapidly in a moment. But at least as importantly, it allows you to make comparisons across an entire country. And so if you have a patient here in Palo Alto, California at Stanford, who's got a fatigue of 65. This is all normed, by the way, with a US average of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. So if you've got somebody with a fatigue at 65 here, 1.5 standard deviations above the mean, it means exactly the same. And boy, am I geographically challenged. But you're up here, right? So <laughs> it means exactly the same as if you've got somebody with a fatigue of 65 here in Biddeford, Maine. And that allows you to compare across the nation. And now it's even being spread throughout the globe. So where are we with this concept? Well, we rolled this out about four years ago. We integrated in with all sorts of devices. We've now collected over 15,000 unique patients and about 50,000 longitudinal samples. We've been collecting genetic information on our patients as well that we're just starting to integrate that in. We built our own local computer adaptive testing engine to bypass what uh, Promise has done. And we've been establishing a number of collaborative uh, partnerships with other academic institutions throughout the country, and more, least, or more recently internationally, where we're going into Israel, we're having discussions, um, we hope to be establishing a partnership with Canada, Australia, and Ireland. And I think what has really driven home the point to me most is just how it's changed the culture of healthcare and what we do at Stanford. It has really moved us from kind of in, in my opinion to, well, we really have the data. Because at the end of the day, folks, without data, we're all just a bunch of docs with opinions. And so we really need, again, good quality data. So let me just kind of show you some of the results of this and where we're going with it in the future. What we've been able to do is distill down what used to be a 45-minute intake survey in our clinic to about 22 minutes and a follow-up survey which captures a very, very deep phenotype on the patient to about 10 minutes. Nobody complains. Nobody complains about this. I talked with you about computer adaptive testing. I see a lot of young faces in the room. If you've ever taken some of the standardized tests like GREs. When I got into my PhD program for engineering, I had to go in and spend all day with a number two pencil filling out all those bubble sheets. Some of you may remember that. Nowadays, if you go in and take the GRE, within just a few questions using computer adaptive testing, they can know exactly what your math aptitude is. They still keep you in that seat for several hours because they have to justify the $1,000 they're charging you. But they know right off how good your math is. We can do the same thing with characterizing these patients. And so if you look at the blue column here, these are typical legacy instruments you might use to capture domains across anxiety, fatigue, physical functioning, so on and so forth. And if you're going to do this, you're going to answer about 144 questions. Not about. You will answer 144 questions. If you're using computer adaptive testing, it's down to 39. You get about a 75 percent reduction in burden to your patients. That's incredible. That's free. That's just absolutely free. This is where the future is as we move forward in healthcare. I get asked all the time, why can't you just use your standard EMR? And I know that here at this medical center, you guys use an electronic medical record. The short answer is that while we've all looked to these EMRs to be our saviors as a way of mining data and drawing inferences from it, the short answer is you can't. That the quality of the data in most, almost all EMRs is just terrible. The reason is, is because they're not built to characterize your patients. They're built to build them and to schedule them and to order labs and present those lab results. I also get asked this question, oh, the other issue is one of flexibility. And so if you're going to try to do innovation within an EMR these days, they operate at a subglacial pace from an innovation standpoint. When the IOM released their vital signs report on measuring core metrics, it would have taken multiple, multiple, multiple months for EPIC, our EMR, to build it. We had it up and running in 40 hours. And so that's where these platforms have their flexibility for innovation. The question always comes up about using REDCap. For some of you, you may be familiar with this electronic data capture platform out of Vanderbilt. It's an incredible platform. If you're doing clinical research and research studies, you want to get and use REDCap. And we use it all the time in our lab, but it doesn't work well in a clinical setting. 
For characterizing your patients and being flexible, it falls flat because it's too, it's too rigid in its ultimate design. Why do these platforms ultimately fail when I go throughout the country, throughout the globe, and I hear the stories of registries after registries and platforms after platforms failing? It's because they fail to get buy-in from all the key stakeholders, from the patients, from the physicians, from the physical therapists, from the front and back office staff. And so the key is that for these types of systems to succeed, you have to give added value back. And so this is what we've been doing um, with Choir. We provide people with a patient report to be able to assess how their patient is doing and tracking them longitudinally. We build in an automatic note generator. If there's any clinicians in the room using an EMR, you know how laborious it is to type up those clinical notes. We now build in features where it does about 80 to 90 percent of your note generation for you. So it now provides time back to you to spend with the patient face to face rather than you're doing what we all have typically done with EMRs, which is we turn our back to the patients and we're typing up the note. We've also built in opioid risk calculators, opioid titration calculators. We're very tuned in with the opioid issue, and so we want to provide tools back to people. We're also using this as a tool for research, and I'm going to give you some examples of this and what we've learned from it and where it's opened our eyes up to it. So going back to Sandra. So Sandra originally came to me from the Magic Kingdom, and when she came to me, she filled out a choir. She came over and filled out a bunch of these instruments. And what we find here is that higher scores are of worse function. Worse function. She's high in anxiety. She's high in depression. She's high in fatigue. She's got a lot of physical dysfunction, pain interference, and pain behavior. And so, surprisingly, she hadn't been tried on a simple tricyclic antidepressant, which works for pain and mood. And then also have been studying this drug called low-dose naltrexone, which uh, for the uh, science geeks in the audience, it's a toll-like 4-receptor antagonist that blocks neuroimmune and neuroinflammatory mediators. And we've published a couple papers on this in fibromyalgia, and I'm running a clinical trial on CRPS. And what you see here is a dramatic reduction in her fatigue, her anxiety, her depression. Uh, for any of the medical students, what are you noting is not changing on that slide? Any takers? Anything here that's not really budging? Physical function. Well done, physical function. Physical function isn't budging at all, at all. That runs counterintuitive to everything we've been taught in that if you reduce pain, you reduce pain interference, physical function will improve. Turns out it doesn't. I'm going to get back to that. What we did is I put a health educator uh, on Sandra to work with goal setting, physical function, and uh, goal-oriented behaviors. She wanted to hike more, walk more, and it led to, in essence, an increase in her physical function. We've seen this now with many, many thousands of patients, this de decoupling between pain, pain interference, and physical function. Why is it really even important? It's important because all of the national guidelines and the state guidelines that I've helped write some of these in California, we all say that for insurance companies to get approval for treatments for your patients, you have to show improvement in pain and function, pain and function. And yet when you go to the appendices and they offer up what instruments to use, they're offering you instruments on pain interference. And so we're being asked at the state and federal level to measure the wrong thing. So this paper, by the way, to describe this is now in review, and we're hoping to get this in soon because we think it'll have a significant impact on policy issues around what to measure. I think I'm going to skip through this one quickly just for the sake of time. What we can do is characterize an entire clinic, and what I can share with you is that patients who have chronic pain, when you look at them on the thousands, have significant dysfunction across all dimensions of physical, psychological, and social functioning. So we use this information to take it out to our legislators, to the insurance companies, to show just how impacted they are and why we need more resources. The ultimate goal with these platforms and where we should be going is to turn our clinics into research labs. Not where we're researching patients without their consent, but where we're characterizing each and every patient that comes into your clinic and gaining useful information from them and then using that information for real-world clinical trials, not where we're filtering out 90% of patients, but where every patient will, after approval and consent, will get enrolled into a clinical trial, and we can start answering questions that are important to us. I will tell you as a pain physician, 
I've got these 200 medications to use. We've got about a half a dozen that we use all the time, tricyclics, SNRIs, anticonvulsants, opioids. And if you ask me the question, you know, Sean, which one, does a tricyclic work better than an SNRI or better than acupuncture? There's not a person on this planet that can answer that question. And yet we hand these out like candy all the time. We need to be able to figure out what's working better and at what cost. I'm going to skip over this slide, which gets at the clinic note generation. The power of this type of package is on a large scale is that we can capture huge amounts of data in a relatively short period of time. If you go onto clinicaltrials.gov and you look at low back pain studies, you'll see that there's about 500 low back pain studies out there. About 600 is the number of subjects that they have on mean. At the last count, we had over 15,000 subjects that have completed longitudinal data in this type of registry that we're mining. And we've learned a lot from the body maps from this. And so there's a large interest in the NIH about overlapping pain conditions. And we've been able to characterize patients according to the type of clinical condition. And by the way, the studies all show that the number one chronic painful condition out there is low back pain. But you want to know what the number one chronic pain area that people check off on a body map in a pain clinic? This one caught me by surprise. It's the foot and ankle. We never talk about it. But far and away, it's much more marked off than any other area of the body. Don't ask me what it means. We're just diving into it now. We've been able to start doing advanced analytics on this data and learn some inter intriguing aspects. And so this is Drew Sturgeon up here who uh, does a lot of structural equation modeling and path analysis, network analysis. And what we've learned is that through typical path analyses, we all have known that when you have an increase in pain, that it leads to a decrease in physical function and more pain interference. We all know that intuitively. But what we didn't know is that all of the nodes, all of the paths through that go through fatigue. Fatigue, it's a central node in chronic pain. We don't talk much about fatigue. We don't have very good treatments for fatigue. But we're learning through this massive amount of data that it's playing a central node. Drew just followed up with another study that was just published. He's got a strong interest in social functioning, also did some structural equation modeling on this data. We all intuit that when your pain goes up, when your patient's pain goes up, their physical function goes down. And as a consequence of that, that they get upset, they get depressed, they get angry with that decrease in physical function, right? We all know that. But here's the key, here's the surprise. That entire model, that node, when you put in satisfaction with social roles, gets subserved by it. What I mean by that is, what's really going on is that your pain is going up, your physical function goes down, and then it's your inability to engage with your family and friends, your social network, that's then causing you to become depressed and anxious. It's that social functioning that's playing a key role here. And we've always, you know, talked about pain being this biopsychosocial model, but that S, that social, has always become a small s. And I think that what we're going to see in the future is that that S is going to get elevated to a position it deserves, recognizing that we're all ultimately social creatures. One last data slide here. This one's in review. I don't usually show data that's not been published, but I thought this would be of interest to you because of the opioid angle. Beth Darnell is one of our clinical and research psychologists, strong interest in catastrophizing and in sex differences around opioid prescribing. And so ask this question, the simple question, are there differences between men and women in prescribing opioids? And so we looked at a large amount of this data. And we find out that, to nobody's surprise, yes, there are differences. What are those differences? Well, if you are a man, you are much more likely on this heat map to be prescribed an opioid because you have an increase in pain intensity. If you're a woman, you're much more likely to be prescribed opioids if you have high pain catastrophizing. Now, what is catastrophizing? Catastrophizing has got these three parts. It's a trifecta of negative amplification, rumination of repetitive thoughts, and a sense of loss of control. And everybody catastrophizes about something. Number of you here, medical students, right? Yes? Have any of you ever been in the classroom and are thinking to yourself, oh my God, medical school's never going to end. It's just going to go on forever and ever. I'm never going to be a physician. This day, this lecture is droning on and on forever. That's catastrophizing, folks. It has the biggest predictor in pain of bad pain outcomes, of negative amplification, of persistent pain. And so we learn these sex differences. But what is also intriguing is that with large amounts of data, you can start doing really advanced analytic approaches. 
beyond the typical type of linear modeling that we usually use in most papers. In this case, it's a general additive model, which allows us to, non, in a nonlinear way, map a curve of the likelihood to be on opioids and this pain catastrophizing scale. Now, what we've been doing since the PCS has come out decades ago is we're all focusing attention in this area here with a PCS around 30 or 31 and saying that's where we have to pay attention. But what we've now seen is that this, what has been previously subclinical area down here is incredibly important. That means that lower amounts of emotional distress, things that we have typically just kind of swept under the carpet and not paid attention to, are incredibly important for our patients. And so we're starting to pay a lot more attention to that. I'm going to skip over that slide with an intervention that we did that we're starting to deliver through choir and mention one last application here, and that's in the perioperative space. And so here's another little point to set the stage for the medical students. Surgery is nothing more than a controlled injury. Surgery is nothing more than a controlled injury. We take patients into an operating room, we shove a piece of PVC tubing down their throat, we dial up poisonous gases, we make them unconscious, amnestic, so that they don't move, they can't feel anything, and then a surgeon takes a scalpel with the idea of curing, but it's honestly no different than if somebody walks across the street and gets hit by a car. They're just unconscious. And what we've learned from this controlled injury is there's a lot of parallels between surgery and having a low back pain episode or another injury out in the playing field, and that is that the factors that bring you to that injury, the factors that bring you to that injury often have more to do with how you're going to do after surgery or after that injury than the nature of the injury itself. And that means, and we've published now several papers on this, that what you bring to surgery from the standpoint of anxiety, pre-existing anxiety, depression, any history of PTSD, those are incredibly predictive to whether you're going to have chronic pain after surgery, which turns out the number is around, on average, 10%. And so what we're doing is we're putting choir into a pre-op clinic where every single patient that goes to surgery is now getting deeply characterized. And so that we can build risk and treatment stratification models to identify those people who are going to be at risk for the development of chronic pain and, really relevant here, the development of persistent opioid use. Where are we trying to go and where is the future for all this heading? Well, you can use analogies of genetics. If you go back in time decades, you look back on the southern plot where using laborious uh, gel electrophoretic after a gel electrophoretic approach, you could get a gene expression. That moved into the gene microchip array up here where you can now look at thousands of genes and genetic expression and now CYTOF where you can peer inside into the molecular machinery. Can we do the same thing with these patient-reported outcomes? And the answer is yes. We move from pen and paper instruments to hierarchical clustering and modeling, where these represent a row of every single patient. Every column is a domain of physical, psychological, and social functioning. And we can find clusters like this cluster right here that represents people with high amounts of pain but low amounts of anxiety, depression, and anger. These are more resilient people. And you move into things like Bayesian network reconstruction, which allow us to just completely data-driven approaches, allow it to form network representations of our patients to understand what's important. And here what we find, pain catastrophizing, fatigue, social isolation, again, showing up again in these data-driven models. Where we're ultimately looking to go is to flip the science, to take it from its traditional bench-to-bedside model and instead go from bedside to bites to bench and then back again. In other words, to use the human, the real patient in our clinic, to be able to identify the mechanisms and the markers, to be able to give that to the basic scientist who can build the knockout mice and then can develop the therapies that we can then put back into the clinical environment to test it out. And we're seeing this not only in our group but in now in groups across the globe. So where we're going in the future is we're building out aggregated data repositories to be able to bring in data from other uh, locations, more software-based decision-making, building in those adaptive randomization models, building in uh, support for those uh, uh, iPhones and the daily experiential sampling. We're doing a lot of pain testing on people and building also a consumer-facing front end. And where this is particularly good for trainees, by the way, and there's a big reason why I've mentioned this, is it's offering up opportunities for trainees to do research that they never could do before. So in the past, we couldn't have trainees really come in the lab briefly because our research was too complicated with the brain imaging. But we've now been supporting 
for instance, postdocs and predocs to either visit us or get access to the data. This one, Junie Carrera, was, is at McGill finishing up her PhD. She wanted to in, look at social injustice and acceptance. We put in some questionnaires from a QI standpoint, and within a few weeks, we got 800 samples, and we handed it to her when she got off the plane. And she said, we could have never done this at McGill. And so we've been using this as a platform, and we've been opening this up to other institutions who want to have a, ch a look at it. So in the end, what it's all going to is coming back to Sandra. Ideally, with the ability, this is a picture of her recently. She's doing great, and she just had her first child. Where we ultimately want to go is to be able to help achieve President Obama's vision for precision medicine, to be able to have the right treatment for the right patient in the right condition. And so with that, uh, that's our vision. Let me close out and give my thanks again to the NIH Pain Consortium, and then a lot of this has all just come from philanthropy, who's been supporting these efforts, as well as the people at Northwestern and other institutions. And maybe at the end, we'll see if I've still got time for question and answers, but again, it's been a real delight and honor to be here with you. Thank you.